Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. He's smoking already. It's up early on the West Coast. We As got he Scott should. Storch. Wake and bake. I'm not mad at you. What up, brother? Uh, 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 how you quarantining, Scott? Man, I'm. You know what? I just been here on. I, I live on a cul-de-sac, and you know we just been maintaining this thing. I've been cooking up literally since this thing started every day in the studio. I'm lucky I got you know a, you know a, a incredible team around me, and like you know we just here bidding, you know doing. What are you working on when you say cooking up? What are you working on? Um, making some beats, working on my album, working with Kevin Gates, working with a bunch of artists. Um, right now you know gang of stuff gang of stuff i, I thought you were talking about actual food because you ain't got nobody to be with you because you by yourself <laughs> I, I thought you was cooking your own meals white we've been cooking up a little too much man i've been eating too much <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about this now, listen, battle. how did the battle come about how, how what was the phone call like did you jump into it let's let, let's break down the battle well i got the call from tim and swiss and you know originally um they they had me uh paired up with t Payne. And then I woke up the next day and they were like, no, that, we're going to do something different. We want to put you with Manny. And, um, you know, I was like, I'll take the smoke from wherever, you know. Um, now, you know, you know Manny I, I so saw you. Records? I saw you. Did you know Manny has so many records or, or, or you knew kind of his catalog? You knew what it was going to be. No, I know his catalog, you know, uh, you know, and he, me and him been cool for a long time. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was just I was down for whatever. I got a lot of faith in my catalog. I didn't really, um, you know, delve into everything that I had in my in my catalog. I left a lot of stuff out. You know, I got, I got you know several hundred songs and uh, a lot of you know a lot of records that um, maybe I didn't think fit the battle correctly. I didn't, wasn't going to play like Grammys like from Pink or from Christina Aguilera and stuff. I just didn't feel like that belonged in the battle. You know what I mean? Let's talk about that catalog, Scott, because I, I saw you on Fat Joe's Live and, 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 and you thought I was trying to disrespect you, which I wasn't. I just had questions as a fan of hip hop and the culture. I'm just like, okay. how much credit can Scott Storch take for beats that we were always told Dr. Dre did? Uh oh, let's talk about it. Listen, Dr. Dre is a huge whale, uh, you know, if not the biggest producer ever in, in the history of hip hop music, you know, so sometimes when your name sits next to a name that big, you know, it, it kind of like overshadows, you know, especially when I was getting started in the business with, you know, I was a young man, like, you know, just coming up. So a lot, when those records came out a lot, you know, people didn't really read all the credits and see who was doing what. And, and, you know, as far as playing that music in the battle, you know, my sound, I think, is, is pretty clear when people hear it. You know, if I, I'm not going to play something. If I'm not like a, I'm one of the main nucleuses or foundations of what these tracks are, and I didn't feel like, you know, it deemed playing it. And, you know, I, 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 I really feel like, you know, the, the co-production and writing and whatever, whatever I, I, I contribute, I, I bring mine to the table. You know what I mean? When it comes so, to these records. even when you say your sound, even when you say your sound is like uh, people know it when they hear it. I don't know, only because I don't know what Scott did. I know, like I know, Lean Back. I know, Make It Rain. I know a lot of those records, but I'm talking about like the classic joints you were playing, like The Watcher and Break Your Neck. Okay. And well, the Watcher Two, The Watcher Two. That was what I played. I didn't play the original Watcher. It's a different record. It's a different track and different, you know, and everything. But. Um, you're not credited on that at all. On 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 original watcher, no. Yeah. And on blueprint, it's it's it says just says Dr. Dre. Well, I looked, you know, I, I I contributed in in the you know the keys and and writing in the top lines and stuff and you know sometimes we you know the credits don't reflect what what actually went down on the record and not in all cases but it happens and you know sometimes but um. You know, in terms of me legitimately being a part of everything I played, a hundred percent. Come on. Come so on. Scott Storch, you from the you from the era where producers uh would produce but not necessarily get the credit. It would just be the big name. So we we've seen it with Diddy, we've seen it with Dre, we've seen it with a lot of producers, but you were involved and you were there making those beats as as well. hundred percent. A hundred percent. hundred percent. 
And, you know, it, it's like the fact that during the battle, the first thing, look, the first thing that bothered me was the, 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 the uh, skits and stuff that was like kind of knocking me and all that. And then when, when I saw this interview where he was saying that it wasn't cool that I was playing these collaborations, I was thinking to myself, I didn't know he was making a new set of rules because, you know, everything that I had seen, I'd seen a lot of collaborative efforts on a lot of the prior battles. And, you know, I felt like that was fair game. So, you know, like, like, how did you feel about those kids when he was taking shots at you? you? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. Now I was going to say, what do you think the rules should be? Because should it be that if you're accredited on a song, then you can play it? Because a lot of things are collaborations. Like you said, what should the rules be moving forward? Because these battles are still going on. And so there's still some questions because I don't know what the ground rules are. Did they give you guys any rules? Are they made up as you go along? There was no ground rules. And it was, you know, there's nobody saying that you couldn't play R&B or, 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 you know, you know, urban crossover records or whatever, like, you know, I had, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, like, say Kanye West and Pharrell was to do a battle. Is Kanye not allowed to play any of the stuff he did with Mike Dean? Is, is Pharrell not allowed to play anything he did with Chad? Or even like, for example, a record that Timberland and I did together, which was Cry Me a River, he played that in the battle. You know what I mean? Like, I think it, 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 music is a collaborative effort a lot of times. And I, I would have to say maybe somewhere in Louisiana somewhere, there's probably a lot of uh, bass players, keyboard players that brought magic to some of the records. Maybe that Manny did and that, you know, maybe they weren't even credited for or whatever. I'm just hypothesizing. But I'm, I'm just saying, like, I didn't set out when I started making music to make it all by myself. If I feel like I'm an integral part in something, I'm going to play it on a beat battle. You know what I mean? And that's and that's that. I mean, and I think that's what that's what that's what we as fans don't know. We don't know about these collaborations because I remember back in the day when you and Timberland was beefing over Cry Me a River, and he was saying, "Oh, he's just a piano man," and then you told him that he wasn't. Uh, what you, I, I forgot. Well, I forgot what you said to him, but he said you weren't a real producer. You were just a piano man. You know what I mean? It, it stuff like that happens, you know what I mean, and and it is what it is, and it's water under the bridge. Um, but you know, I just felt like maybe that was just an excuse, and like somebody who was feeling a little salty about you know not winning the battle. So I just you know, if I would have lost, I would have you know taken it like a man. You know what I'm saying? Like, but you know. Dude called me the next day and was apologetic for calling me like out on being having drug problems in my past and stuff like that. And that was cool. And, and what did you what, what did you think about those skits when, when he played those skits live and, and y'all back and forth because the battles are live and you started hearing those skits and it just wasn't one. It was a couple of skits. What was your mentality at the time? Because it looked like it didn't bother you when we were watching it. But but what was your feeling? During I mean, that time? it was it was it was tasteless. Look. There's nothing that people can say about me. I, I, I you know, I, I, I've learned to, to deal with stuff like that. You know, the, you can only imagine the stuff I had to read about myself. Look, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I blew a hundred mil doing drugs and doing stupid stuff. And, you know, I, that's, I gotta, I gotta deal with that. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, you know, I had to rebuild. Kind of and, a legend for that though, Scott. I mean, <laughs> he's a we, legend we, for more yeah, than can, that. We, we, can, we can call you stupid for that too, but we can also say, God damn, to have a hundred mil to blow. It's kind of legendary. I bet you that movie, that'd be a hell of a movie. Wolf of Wall Street wouldn't have shit on that. I'm not going to talk about it, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's shit's going down right now. So, but I just don't want to like, you know, talk about things prematurely. Oh, so, so it is going to be a movie based on Scott's thoughts is what you're saying. That's the Wolf of Wall Street meets music. <laughs> wow. Makes no, that's, no, that's, that's, that makes perfect sense. Whoever's doing that is, is, is thinking right. They're very small. How did you yeah, respond right. to M- Manny Fresh in that phone call, though? Because I know he apologized to you for that the next day. Like you said, he called you. What was your response? You guys are still cool, right? Yeah. I'm, I mean, you know, I, I thought we were still cool. I mean, and then I seen this interview where he was like, kind of like, you know, tripping on me. I, I, but, you know, it is like, what it is. I don't, I don't hold grudges. What did you like in the interview? What did you say that you thought was foul or you thought was wrong? People just people the whole fact that, that, that I should be disqualified because I, I did co- collabs and I, I like, it's whatever, you know. I could have chose a hundred other records that would have as well win, won those rounds that I did all by myself. I played stuff that, you know, I thought was cool. You know what I mean? I, I didn't expect, when I played The Watcher, 
you know, I just expected, I was just warming up with that. And that was just something that I thought for, for hip hop and for, for the culture that people would, would be feeling, you know what I'm saying? I could have played that uh, uh, maybe one of another five or six records I got with, with, with 50 or with the game or with this one or that one. I don't know. I, I, I chose that record. <laughs> how, how hard is it to be quiet about these classic records you made, though? Because, I mean, if you're making these records and they're blowing up, becoming the biggest records in the world, but you're not getting the credit for it, like, how quiet is it to say, hey, that's me? Bro, I'm paying my, I was paying my dues. You know what I'm saying? I got plenty of credit. I got plenty of pats on the back, awards, Grammys in my career. So we all got to get where we got to go. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of people that come up under producers. You know what I mean? And that's how they get. And you can't blame people because you know what? That big entity is providing a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of placements. And, you know, there's money involved in that and you're growing. And that's just part of the, part of the process, man. You said you're also working on your album right now. So tell us a little bit about that and what's done so far. I mean, I got some cool stuff. Um, I got my first single coming out very shortly. It's a little tricky to put stuff out during this, uh, you know, the coronavirus pandemic period. Nah, they say numbers are doing well for the music industry. They said numbers are are, are moving up now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think streaming wise, you know what I'm saying? For sure. But how are you going to support it? Like, if you're not going to be able to cut, like, a real video and get a whole bunch of people in the same place. That's true. And all that stuff is important, Bob. But um, I got my first single coming with Ozuna and Tyga. It's a monster. Okay. It's a monster. I signed to Atlantic Records. And, um, you know, uh, Kevin Weaver, who you know, the, the president of West Coast, he, um, he, he urged me to not just make a regular-ass record. He was like, make a global smash so you can really make an impact first time out and then everything from there a lot of people are going to want to jump on the project and understand what it is so that's coming real soon let me ask you a question when um the house that you had in miami the one that birdman birdman purchased after you rick well, ross actually did a verse the guy russ from the owner of rockstar energy drink bought it <coughs> and um and then uh and then birdman bought it now, when Rick Ross did that verse and he talked about the, you know, the demons the that were left, yeah, and all, yeah, and the, all negative the negative and the, and the and evilness and the, and the negativity of that house. house. What did you think about that when you heard it? What do you think? Do you think that that house has some negative juju in it? Accurate. No, that house still has. I don't know. That house is cursed because I'm sure you know the history of what's going on even since me and Birdman have owned that house. I'm sure you've seen that house in the news, and I'm not only bring that up, but like, you know, there's something. It's. I, I had a house that was so beautiful on what they call Indian Creek Island that back in the day I bought for like six million cash and it's now worth like 35 million and I sold it because it's near Bow Harbor and it was too far from the party which was on South Beach where Star Island and Palm Island is and I wanted to be closer so I could get the whole party back from the club after the crib, you know, to the crib and all that and didn't have to drive 90 blocks. And that was the worst decision I ever made because I stopped working. The party was so close to my house and everybody, you know, that was like a, it was a household word in Miami for that period. Like, you know, there was average attendance of like 75 to a hundred people a night in that house. And it was just all bad. You know what I mean? What well, we live and we learn. Right. But it's definitely <laughs> cursed. And there's definitely truth to it. That's why I can't wait to see the movie. Now, listen, do, do you still talk, talk to Dr. Dre? And, and if you do, does he get uh, upset about, you know, people knowing that you may have contributed to these records a lot more than, than people thought? I mean, Dr. Dre has a massive catalog. You know what I'm saying? I, I can't say that I participated in a, in a, a, a tenth of, of, of his stuff. But, no, he's, he's hella cool. You know what I mean? He's the, he's the conductor sometimes like he plays a Quincy Jones role like he brings the best out of all of us like it was me Mike Elizondo and you know a, a couple of other cats that we was in there and we was cooking Mel up together Melman, yeah Melman was more like the MPC guy that would bring some sample ideas but without Dre's touch on that like come on this is Dr. Dre he's literally I learned so much from him and from being around him and and he knows how to pull the greatest stuff out of us like in terms, of, I could play a hundred keyboard parts, but you know, it's him will be like, "Yo, that's it right there," and he knows. You know what I'm saying? So, I went to the University of Dr. Dre. 
You know what I'm saying? There's a rapper who told me they was in the studio with y'all and uh, he, he wanted a Dr. Dre beat and one of the A&Rs or somebody at the label goes, look, you can get a Dr. Dre beat and pay X, Y, Z amount of money or you can just get it from the white guy over there playing the keys because he's going to make the beat anyway. <laughs> I don't know. That might have been whoever that was, something that Dre wasn't interested in working on. That I, Maybe I, I took advantage of some of his his extra shit like you know what i'm saying but look what dre is much more than just a producer like he's a he's a a record mogul like he's sold a lot of records on his labels over the years he's made stars you know and and you know i'm 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 hoping to blossom into somebody that does that i i wasted a lot of time in my career not developing artists and and you know that there's always a better late than never you know what i'm saying so I'm doing that now. I'm starting out with my album, and um, I'm hoping to break some new artists and and um, and get to that point. You know what I'm saying? But now nah, Dre and I are hella cool. You know, he he calls me from time to time. He's one of the few people that'll call you on your birthday or on Christmas and wish you a, a Merry Christmas and stuff like that. Whereas people twenty leaps below him won't even do that. You know what I mean? We keep on hearing about how producer money nowadays isn't the same as how it used to be when people were getting those huge bags. Because people's budgets aren't the same, right? So how is that now? Just getting money for a beat? You know, is there other things that you look at, like the back end? Or how is it to get a Scott Storch beat nowadays? Yeah. I mean, really, like, when you look at a price tag for a beat, um, it's called a producer advance. And that's against your royalties. your me- Not publishing royalties, but your mechanical royalties. And, like, the more you take up front, the longer it's going to take to recoup. So if you're making good records and they're selling, you're making money. Like these kids out here are not getting little publishing deals. There's, there's some cats that get two or three records off and the publishers get excited and they catch in a two, $3 million check off of that. You know what I mean? So I think the money has get, gotten a lot better and they've learned how to make money off of streaming. And, and you know, you just need to um, be uh, putting your all and heart and soul into these records so they go. So they go, you make money. You know what I mean? It's not the same because you just have to be a little more creative and work a little harder and do a few more extra records. And so to make up for the fact that the sales of of physical copies isn't the same. You know what I mean? But that radio, if you get a big radio record that's streaming big, it's still good. A nice big global record like you're about to do? Hell yeah. (laughs) Yo, you know what, Scott? I, uh, also, too, during the battle, man, I saw that you uh, you gave you gave Manny props a lot, and you also said that he inspired "Make It Rain." I think Manny had Manny was too busy trying to get a skit off. <laughs> I think he missed that one. But how, how did Manny inspire "Make It Rain"? Just like you know, like the horns that I use, like like that, like triumphant sounding, like you know, that was that was like literally. I remember Joe being like, "Yo, they called it some South shit back in the day." You know what I'm saying? So, like, we was out attempting to do that that South thing. And, and, you know, he was like, yo, we need to change it up. We need to switch up the vibe for a second. You know, come out of New York for a second and do some do something like that. And I, it worked. You know what I mean? So, so, yeah, it kind of inspired me, like, listening to records like that. You know, but my catalog, I feel like, I've, I've always been a pioneer and, and, and created new sounds and I'm, I'm like a schizophrenic of music. Like I, I, I can go make an R&B record, a West Coast hip hop record, or East Coast, whatever. You know, I, I pride myself on creating like that Middle Eastern sound on sort of being part of the resurgence of the new West Coast sound in the, in the early 2000s and going from like all that P-Funk, you know, type stuff that was going on on the West to where I brought in the keyboards and, the, and the, um, the, the strings and all this orchestral stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that, that was part of my wave. I had a few different waves. I mean, I'm going before that. I feel like me, Quest Love, and a couple other cats, we partially responsible for the birth of Neo Soul in Philly because I lived in Philly and, like, me, James Poyser, and all these guys that we had this keyboard called the Fender Rose, this warm-sounding, soulful keyboard, and we sort of evolved that sound into what it became. How are we supposed to know that if you don't get credit, Scott? I mean, I got credit. <laughs> I, I get, I, I got credit on ninety percent of the music that I made, man. You know, my I, I went down as producer and writer on "You Got Me" <laughs> for the roots. 
Scott, what would you tell some of these younger producers now, right, that are trying to get themselves in position and are being offered opportunities, but maybe not to get the credit, but to be able to produce for other people just to get into position? Is that something that you feel like at some point a young producer who's trying to come up has to do? Or how do you get yourself uh, in that space where you can negotiate more? Or do you think you got to just kind of pay your dues? I would never like give my give uh, uh, up something entirely. I would um, always try and negotiate for at least writers. If you're working with a big producer alongside of them, at least get your name on these records and start earning publishing shares and then evolve into that. And, you know, don't spend your whole life sitting up under somebody. You know, you need to, you know, use that to gain experience and see how the game goes. And then, you know, you just got to start submitting stuff on your own. You know what I'm saying? You got to, like, do it, do it by yourself. You know, Fat Joe and Terror Squad almost beat me up over Make It Rain and um, uh, Clap and Revolve them back in the day because I just didn't understand why Fat Joe was making Down South records. I mean, because I'm from the South and, you know, I, I, I got love for all types of music, but I just felt like Fat Joe, the, the super hip hop guy from the Bronx digging in the crates, shouldn't have been doing Down South records. I appreciate the record now, but back then I had a lot of critique about it and I used to write for Ozone Magazine and I didn't even think Fat Joe knew who the hell I was and then I ended up on a plane with Fat Joe and the Terror Squad, and they let me live. I mean, you know, Joe was living down there in Miami. You know, he was doing his thing, and 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 that was the wave. And you're gonna turn the radio on every day. He needs to stay on the pulse of everything. You know, I I think I, I think he he did it tastefully. And um, having uh you know little Wayne on the hook, you know that that didn't hurt either. So, oh no, it makes perfect sense now. <laughs> well, Scott, thank you, man. Go back to your spliff, man. We just wanted you to call yeah. in and, you know, clear, and clear up a few and things. Ginger shot. We appreciate the ginger shot also. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come on now. I got that core energy, you know what I'm saying? Before I go, though, I just wanted to tell y'all um, about what I'm doing real quick. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm opening up a rehab center right now in, in, in California. Um, it's a 200-patient facility wow. where we're using cannabis to heal people off of more harmful substances. And um, I really believe that we are gonna raise the success rate in recovery with this. Wow, is that wow. the first of its kind? Yeah, and, and like the 12-step program is outdated. That was written 50, 100 years ago, whatever it was. That shit ain't working, man. It's these, these um, you know, painkillers and opiates and alcohol and all that stuff, like, that stuff is literally like, a, that's an epidemic too, man. Like it's, it's, it's really, it's really messing up a lot of people. And I know that I was saved by quitting cocaine after eight years and never looked back. And I just picked up a pound of weed and I've been smoking. It helped me with anxiety and getting through the whole recovery process. So I'm trying to pass that, that, that on, man. It's a recipe that works. It's called the now, heavenly does weed really help with anxiety. Cause I, cause I, 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 I I, I said, does weed really help with anxiety? Because I, I, I suffer from anxiety real bad, and I tried to smoke, but I smoked sativa, and that shit no, made my sativa, anxiety go through that. No, Ooh. yeah, no, sativa might intensify it. You want to smoke either a hybrid or an indica or, you know, like, you know, edibles and stuff. Like, it, it helps with a lot of things. It helps with sleeping disorders. Like, Harv from TMZ, I did an interview with him about this, and he was like, man, I was on sleeping medication for 20 years, and it was really bad for my health. I was in bad shape and I started smoking weed and it said, he said it, 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 it's, it helped him, you know, I actually started doing edibles. Yeah. Some nice gummies wow. will help you sleep at night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think, I think, um, I can help almost everybody with this. You know what I'm saying? That, that, that has drug problems. It's a little harder for people that are like on Xanax cause that's like a serious addictive people need to go through a longer detox and then come see me, but painkillers, cocaine, all that stuff, like I can do overnight. I can, I can get somebody going. That's what got you clean. Was it the weed? I, well, it was my will and the weed. I helped a lot, I believe. So, did you ever do like a twelve-step program? Or didn't work. I did <laughs> well, forty-five like, I days in a rehab center, and I had a Ferrari parked out. I left after forty-five days inpatient. Took the Ferrari to my coke dealer's house. And got high that first night. So you told me if it worked. Damn. So yeah. what finally made you say, you know what? I'm going to kick the habit. This weed is going to help. 
my willpower. Because I mean, I love what you're doing. I love the idea of that that uh, the facility you're building. But clearly, you were the guinea pig for that. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know what? I met this girl, this girl Florence, man, and you know that she's. We just had a baby together. We still together. This was five years ago, and she was like, "Yo." Smoke some weed. You're at your best on weed and all this other shit. Leave it alone. She painted me into a corner. And, I, you know, I, I just like, I just thought about my whole life. Like, yo, it's either die, go to jail, or get sober. And that was it. So I did it. Well, that's going to be the message, message in the Scotch Torch facility? Either, I mean, either, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's not the die message. Die or get sober. Die, go to jail, or get sober. No, it's, I mean, facts, like, for real, like, it brings people to their bottom. Like, look what it did to me. Like, I was right. focused for, right. I didn't start doing drugs until I was 30. Like, I was a late bloomer. I, was, I had always been in the studio my whole life. I was never going to clubs or partying. And then all of a sudden, I was like, uh, 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 you know, a lion out of the cage. I'm in the club. People are, like, handing me drugs. And boom, boom, that's it. That fast, I was hooked. Wow, where Man. do you end the Scott Stewart? Where do you end the Scott Stewart movie, like the movie that you're doing? Where does it end? Like, where do you say? You're hey, still hey, writing hey, the last hey, chapters hey. right now. Hopefully, it ends with the success of my new album and my okay. rehab center. <laughs> Perfect. So, is, is it gonna be? Is it gonna be a book, then a movie, or just movie? I mean, it's gonna. There's gonna be a couple of different projects going. I'll, that's all I'm gonna say. I, I, I'm already in talks about doing a book deal with Fifty Cent. I got a couple other projects that are going and a major, major movie is going down. That's all I can say. Dope. We'll be watching that for sure. That's dope. That's, I mean, that's going to literally be like the Wolf of Wall Street meets hip hop. That's going to be dope. Oh, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, I appreciate it. All right, it. Scott. Thank, thank you, bro. Love.